Our next, next speaker is Alberto Guijosa. He is from Instituto de Ciencias Nucleares at the National University here in Mexico. And he's going to talk to us about entang entanglement, QFT, and gravity. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thanks to Lorenzo and Felipe for the invitation. Thank you all for being here. And um, we've had uh, three very nice talks on amplitudes now in a row. And now I apologize because we're going to switch topics. Um, my motivation for this talk is uh, work that I've done with various people. Um, but I, I will choose not to actually tell you in any detail about our results because I prefer to, to, uh, to give you a brief overview of the general ideas, uh, just for the simple reason that that's a better investment of your time. Um, okay, so uh, we all know that quantum entanglement, of course, uh, has long been known to be a useful resource for quantum uh, information. Um, but the main message that I want to get across today is that uh, in, in recent decades, it's also been found to be a very useful concept. Entanglement is a very useful concept directly in quantum field theory and uh, also, as it turns out, in quantum reality. Um, so just for starters, as we all know, uh, entanglement refers to states, entanglement states refer to states that cannot be factorized into subsystems. So the typical example is, is for example, uh, talking about two spin one-half particles. Uh, so this is an example of a not entangled state because its, it's spin is, is undecided on its own and you can, you can assign it a definite state. Uh, whereas this, which is not factorizable, is an example, of course, of, a, of an entangled state. Uh, in which the, 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 the decision of these subsystems is, is shared among them, and there's no definite state uh, for, for each system separately, for each subsystem separately. Uh, now, how, is, how can we quantify this notion? Uh, well, uh, given any quantum system whatsoever, if, uh, we, we, we need to do first uh, two things. One is to split our system into two subsystems, so we, have, we choose a, a particular bipartitioning of our system. So I'm illustrating that here in a, say in a lattice of atoms. Uh, I'm dividing it into these atoms in red that I'm calling the set A, and then the complement that I'm illustrating in green. Um, and then uh, beyond uh, this, this division of, of the degrees of freedom, we also choose a specific state for our overall system. So I'm going to express that generally as a, as a density matrix here, the rho total. Uh, then with those two ingredients, we can do the following two steps. Uh, first of all, we can take the trace over the degrees of freedom in the complement, so over the green atoms in this illustration. And the, the intuitive idea there, the, intuitive, the, the useful way to, to say this intuitively is that we, we're tracing, we're summing over all the possible states of those degrees of freedom that are not accessible to us, say in an experimental sense. Uh, after doing that, we obtain what's known as a reduced density matrix for a subsystem A, and this expresses the best available knowledge we have for, for that part of the system. Now, having that uh, description of the red atoms in this case, of the generic layers of system A, uh, the next step is we can just compute the for Neumann entropy uh, of that uh, density matrix. So that measures how non-pure that density matrix is. And uh, if we do that in the, in the simple example that I mentioned before, in the case of two spins, then we can easily see that if we have a state like this that can be factorized, and we do this computation, then this for Neumann entropy, or known in this, in this setting as the entanglement entropy, turns out to be zero, so expressing the fact that this is not an entangled state. Uh, but if we switch the signs there so that, so that this is not, no longer a factorizable state, then we do the computation, and for this particular state, we get this result, so expressing the fact that indeed this is, uh, this is an entangled state. So in short, what one learns is that uh, this quantity here, uh, known as the entanglement entropy, um, quantifies uh, entanglement no? between, between the two subsystems that we chose in the given state. Uh, so the larger this quantity, the more entanglement there is, there is between these uh, sets of degrees of freedom. Um, now it's called the entire entropy or, on the one hand because it's a generalization of the usual thermal entropy. So we can easily see that if, 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 that if one plugs into here a thermal density matrix, then this uh, reduces to the usual notion of thermal entropy. Uh, more generally, it's entropy in the sense, in this modern sense of information. So that, that's what it is present. Um, okay, now this quantity entanglement entropy has been proven rigorously to satisfy a number of uh, properties, a large list of properties uh, for any quantum system, so that, that's quite impressive. Uh, of course, the quantum systems of interest to us are, are field theories, so now let, let me talk about that. Um, what I want to uh, transmit to you here is that in the past couple of decades, it has become clear that uh, it is in fact very useful, as I said before, to analyze quantum field theories from this perspective of, of computing entanglement entropy. So, uh, just as I said before, if we're going to look at this particular quantum system, uh, any quantum field theory, we need the two ingredients that I mentioned before. 
So first, we need to choose a state over quantum fields. So say the easiest thing is just to choose, to choose the vacuum. Now, when one first hears about uh, exploring or looking for entanglement in the vacuum, one might be confused uh, because it's, it's easy to picture, uh, of course, uh, entanglement, among, uh, entanglement between two spins, uh, two particles. But uh, of course, from a field theory perspective, we're very familiar with the fact that the vacuum is not uh, equivalent to saying that there's nothing there. In the vacuum, one still has the fields and they're in, their, uh, in the ground state, so they're doing something, and it's uh, therefore a valid question to ask how much entanglement there is in that particular state. Okay, so that, then we have a particular state. The next, uh, the other ingredient that we need, as I mentioned before, is to choose um, a by partitioning, so a separation into two sets of degrees of freedom. In a quantum field theory, of course, degrees of freedom are organized uh, spatially, so a very natural way to by partition is just to choose a uh, surface, you choose an imaginary surface, that separates the degrees of freedom that I'm going to call A in some region with its complement. And then we ask how entangled in this particular state of the quantum fields, how entangled are the fields here with the, the fields in the rest of the universe? And with that, we compute with this quantity that I described before, the entanglement entropy. Now, um, for sure, this is, this is different from the usual perspective that we take when we learn, uh, we take any course on, on field theory. In the usual approach, what we compute is our correlators. <coughs> And we usually, usually don't emphasize enough, uh, the students in particular, the, the fact that these, these, these correlations arise precisely from the fact that, uh, that in the given state, say typically the vacuum, the fields at these locations are in fact entangled. So we've only, always, been study, we've always been studying entanglement, um, it's just that we usually don't emphasize that point. And in fact, uh, correlators that we usually deal with are bounded, can be shown to be bounded by entanglement. Uh, so, so in short, what I'm trying to the, the takeaway message from this portion of the talk is that, whereas in the standard story that we all learn to compute uh, correlators in field theory, what we're doing there is using local operators as probes to examine the entanglement pattern of a state, or say the vacuum. That's what we're doing, and using different probes, that is to say, using different operators for the same state, we can we can obtain different answers, of course. But now, from this newer perspective, uh, if we use entanglement entropy, we compute entanglement entropy for our state, then we're getting direct access to the underlying entanglement pattern in, the, in, the, in our field theory state. So in that sense, this perspective is more fundamental. We're getting a deep, this underlying uh, entanglement. Mm, okay, now, uh, this perspective has led to, to insights along various fronts. In particular, most, and most importantly, it has been found that entanglement entropy um, encodes interesting information about the renormalization group in field theory. So uh, mainly, it includes it, it leads to proofs of C theorems and identification of C functions. So, so for those of you who don't know what that is, just statements of, of certain uh, quantities that are monotonic, monotonically decreasing under renormalization group flow. That is to say, when you examine your field theory a larger and larger distance scales, lower, lower, lower and lower energy scales. Um, okay, so that's one type of examples, and there are also other types of constraints on, on renormalization group flows. Um, in a second direction, entanglement entropy also serves as a tool to diagnose phase transitions um, in field theory, so that's also an important development. And for these reasons, you already get a glimpse of the fact that it's actually interesting to try to compute this quantity, entanglement entropy, in field theory. But as it turns out, uh, it is actually very difficult to compute, uh, even in pre-field theories. There's a song and dance that one needs to go through, it goes by the name of uh, Replica Trick. And um, only a very limited number of cases are accessible through traditional field theoretic tools. And because of that, then we search for new tools. And now I'm going to tell you about, or remind you about, a tool that we had now for 20 years, which is known as the ads cft correspondence. Um, and the, the most, uh, well, the more general state, form of the statement is that uh, you can have a quantum field theory in a certain number of uh, space and dimensions, for example, 3 plus 1, which would be a familiar one. Uh, on the other hand, you can have a quantum gravity theory on a space-time uh, that is, of course, dynamical because it's, it's gravity, uh, with, with a larger number of dimensions, at least one more. Um, and the ADS-50 correspondence is just a, the remarkable statement that these two can be the same. Uh, so what one, one is saying is that, despite appearances, these two drastically different, or apparently very drastically different theories are in fact just alternative languages to describe exactly the same physics. It's just one physical system that we're talking about, and we can describe it from two very different perspectives. And there is in fact a dictionary that faithfully translates from one language to the other and back. 
Okay, so that's, that's the generic statement about ADS-CFT. Uh, now, uh, initially one just had a, a very limited number of examples of this correspondence, but over the years, more and more examples have been come to be understood uh, in quite a large detail. Um, and as far as we know, this type of translation could conceivably apply for all quantum field theories, but today we only know it in, in full control for quantitative control only for certain classes of quantum field theories, so that, that's the status. Uh, for example, an, an, an interesting uh, known and understood uh, case or classes of examples of this is when the quantum field theory on this side is, happens to be a non-abelian gauge theory, which is of course a case of a, a, a huge interest to us. In that case, uh, certainly the quantum gravity theory on this side is the string theory. Uh, so that there's a particular uh, subset of, of statements that one is making here. Yeah. Okay, now, um, in this setting, let me put it in, into a cartoon now. Uh, the field theory lives in, well, there's time, which I'm not including in the picture, and then there's some number of spatial dimensions, which I'm labeling as X here, these horizontal dimensions in my picture. Uh, what I'm saying is that the, the gravitational theory lives in at least one more dimension, so this, the, there are these same dimensions here, X, horizontally, but that this extra in dimension that I'm indicating vertically, that's known for historical reasons as a radial direction, and then the natural question is, what the hell is this in the original language? If there's really a dictionary that faithfully translates between the two? Well, as it turns out, uh, this extra coordinate, uh, what it means on this side, is just the energy scale of your field theory. So what one, when one is describing a field theory, one uh, first of all decides where to, where to, where, which point on space time to, to sit, to carry out the experiment. But then a second decision is what your resolution scale, be it a distance scale or an energy scale of your experiment is going to be. So you decide to sit, say, at the LHC and you decide to do experiments with a certain energy scale. Uh, well, that energy scale, this mu here, uh, which is also the energy scale of the renormalization group, um, is precisely what maps to this extra dimension here. In such a way then that uh, going very, very high up on my, in my drawing corresponds to going to the ultraviolet of the quantum field theory, so what happens at high energies and going very low in my drawing uh, corresponds to the infrared of the, of the um, field theory on the left hand side. So then, what I'm saying in summary is that uh, at heart, this equivalence, the ADS-CFT correspondence, is known um, in retrospect to the uh, geometrization of the renormalization group. So, so this is um, information about uh, how this field theory um, uh, has a different aspect, how it changes, how it evolves as one changes the energy scale the resolution scale, is uh, geometrized in this sense. It's deposited at different uh, vertical positions in the drawing on the right. Um, okay, now, uh, in particular, this leads to the, the following consequence. Uh, one normally likes to talk about quantum field theories that are well defined at arbitrarily high energies, and such theories will necessarily reduce to conformal field theories in the ultraviolet, so theories that are scale invariant in particular. Uh, well, that refers to something happening all, all the way here in the ultraviolet, and that, what, that, what that is, is uh, the geometry here, as it turns out, because of the symmetries here, has to reduce to what's known in, by the relativists as anti decider space time. So the, the simplest space time after Minkowski uh, is just a space time with a constant negative curvature. That, that's what you get. Uh, and that's what I was referring to, or that's an example of what I was referring to as uh, with the statement here about boundary conditions. So the geometry inside can of course be drastically deformed because this is a gravitational theory, but, uh, but uh, at the top of my drawings, the geometry has to reduce to ADS in this class of examples. So that uh, explains the name. Okay, now, again, going back to the, the generic idea, one has a field theory, and on the other side, one has a quantum gravity theory. Uh, now, of course, quantum gravity is, uh, is uh, uh, an intimidating beast, and uh, if one wants to start talking about it, it's natural to, to do the easiest thing first. So one one looks at easy calculations in the regime where gravity is classical and the geometry is weakly curved. And if one uses the dictionary to go to the other side, that turns out to correspond to having many fields in this quantum field theory here, and also those fields are strongly coupled. Now, interestingly, that's of course precisely the regime of the quantum field theory that we certainly do not understand with traditional tools. Uh, so what I'm saying is that um, easy computations on this side can give us access to this previously inaccessible region. Um, and indeed, in the, on the gravity side, there's a simple recipe to compute quantum field theory correlators to regularize them, renormalize them, and so on. Uh, so that, that, in that sense, this, this statement has certainly been very useful. Uh, now, going back to our original intention, uh, let me ask then how to compute entanglement entropy, which I told you is an interesting object to compute. Um, 
in the field theory how to use this, this tool, which is ADS-CFT, to do it on the gravity side. Well, the recipe ends up being the following. First, you draw the same boundary here that you had between A and the complement, the boundary of A. You draw at the top of my drawing and, uh, on the right-hand side of the gravity description. Why at the top? Because that's ultraviolet information. The location of this imaginary surface is ultraviolet information. Okay, then the next step is you hang from there a surface, uh, and you look at all surfaces that can be hung from there, surfaces with a restriction that they can be deformed continuously back up to, to the boundary. And then you compute the, the, the area of such surfaces, and you choose the surface, the special surface that minimizes the area, has a minimal area for those boundary conditions. You divide that area by four, four times the Newton constant. There's a Newton constant here because it's gravity. And, uh, and these folks here, Ryu and Takayanagi in 2006, proposed that this is actually, surprisingly, the, the way to compute what, uh, what we want to compute on this side, which is the entanglement entropy. Um, now, uh, just a, a disclaimer here. Uh, this formula is actually a simplified version of the formula, which is valid in the regime that I described before. When the quantum field theory on this side has many fields, in fact, infinitely many fields, and it also has infinitely strong coupling. But extensions away from that point are known. So I'm not going to go into them, but, but that's what we're talking about. Okay, now we look at this formula, and, and as I mentioned before, this entanglement entropy on the left hand side is the generalization of the usual thermal entropy. Uh, now, what we're seeing in this magical formula on the, on the right hand side, many of you have already recognized as a generalization of the usual Bekenstein Hawking formula for the entropy of black holes. So, this is a very surprising connection. In particular, this is a highly quantum object, and this is just a classical area. Um, and yet, this uh, seemingly crazy formula has been found to lead to results uh, that are consistent with all expected properties of for entanglement entropy, and in fact has found a, a derivation in the work of Lekovitsa Maldacena uh, many years later, about uh, seven years later than, uh, than the original proposal by Rio Takaya 9. Um, okay, now, uh, so then the bottom line there uh, of this part is that I'm saying if we start, if we, we start with this formula, and we go from, from the easy side to the difficult side, uh, we're learning that ADS-CFT is a very efficient tool to compute this particular quantity, among others, which is entanglement. Okay? Now, let me just briefly mention that in this context, work that we've done has related to how to renormalize entanglement entropy. We normalize it coming from the gravity side, but I'm, I won't say any more about that for lack of time. Now, this, this direction here is already, of course, hugely uh, important, hugely useful in the, in the, in the practical sense. But from a conceptual sense, it's even more interesting to go in the other direction. Because, see, what's happening in this direction is not, nothing short of a miracle. But what I'm saying is that one starts with a field theory, non-gravitational field theory, in few dimensions. And then out of that, these degrees of freedom somehow secretly know, somehow they, they know a way to reassemble themselves into degrees of freedom that describe a larger geometry and moreover a dynamical geometry. Uh, now, in more detail, the formula that I just described, the Ruta Kayanagi formula, tells us that if we know the pattern of entanglement uh, in our quantum field theory state, say the vacuum, then uh, through that formula we, we can compute uh, these areas of minimal uh, area surfaces on the gravity side. And therefore, from that, from that information, we can deduce what the geometry is, but how, how the space time is curved on this state, which is the translation of this particular quantum field theoretic state, say the vacuum. Okay, so in, in short, what I'm saying is um, the, the, one wonders where the information about this curved geometry is on this side. Well, Ryu and Takayanagi are telling us that the answer is uh, it's hidden in the pattern of entanglement, of quantum entanglement in this, in this uh, field theory state. Okay, now again, just very briefly mentioning, we've done work in this context, going in this direction, for the particular case when one only has access to a portion a finite portion of the quantum field theory, but again, I won't go into detail of that, because I want to use the remaining time to talk about, uh, just very briefly, three uh, useful uh, lessons that have been um, understood with this, with, this, uh, with this technology. One is, well, uh, I told you before that each uh, particular quantum field theory state here corresponds, uh, can be translated into a particular curved geometry on this side. So, so in short, you can, you can read off the metric on this side, by figuring out how much entanglement you have on this side. Now, suppose you start with a vacuum, and then uh, the vacuum of the field theory, and then you add on top of that some small excitations. Uh, well, certainly what will happen is that the, the entanglement entropy, the, the pattern of entanglement will change in some particular way. No? And there's, this, so what you can, there's a formula for that you can deduce uh, from just the definition of entanglement entropy. So there's a certain statement there. 
Okay, now, if we translate to the other side, what will this tell us? Well, based on what I said before, this will imply on the gravity side that small excitations, so when you pass to a different uh, state that is no longer the one, uh, the translation of the vacuum, but this translation of these small excitations on top. Uh, well, since the pattern of entanglement changes, then the space and geometry will change on this side, okay? So that sounds good. I mean, we're trying to, to construct here a gravity theory or reproduce a gravity theory. It sounds uh, appropriate that if you have excitations, they will distort the geometry, no? So the geometry is dynamical. Okay, but now if you look at this in more detail, if you translate this formula, this particular way in which ent uh, entanglement changes to this side, surprisingly, what you, what you find out is precisely the Einstein equation. So what I'm saying is that, uh, hard, as, hard to believe as it is, uh, one can start purely with the language of quantum entanglement in the field theory and uh, translate that uh, into, into this other language using ADS-CFT, and one deduces uh, the Einstein equation just from the story of entanglement. So that, that's a very remarkable achievement. Um, okay, now one other topic that I want to talk about is uh, that uh, in this, in this uh, context, the overall lesson that has been extracted is that the role played by entanglement in the gravity side is, is that entanglement is sort of the glue that holds geometry together. And there are many examples of that, but let me give you the, the, the first one that we had and the simpler one. So suppose now on the field theory side, I take two field theories, or take two copies of the same field theory, and, um, and um, I take them to be in certain state, but importantly, they're, they're not, they're decoupled from one another, so they're not interacting. Uh, they're, they're strongly interacting in themselves, but they're not, they're not interacting with one another. And I choose them to be first in an unentangled state, okay? So a factorizable state. This, this field theory is doing what it wants to do, and this other field theory is doing its separate thing. Okay, now as you might expect, that corresponds to, in uh, this ADF field theory translation, that this field theory state has its corresponding geometry, and this as well, but those are two disconnected geometries, as it, it's natural to expect. Okay, now the novelty is that if you add entanglement to this picture, so now you have, still the theories are not interacting, but now you, take, you pick a uh, state that is entangled, uh, in fact, very entangled in a particular sense. Uh, among these field theories. Well, now you find out that the geometry here is suddenly connected. Now the two geometries that were disconnected before are, are suddenly connected, and there's a, there's a bridge going from one side to the other. There's this, uh, what relatives is called a wormhole going from one side to the other. So, so in that sense, that's just a very specific example of how entanglement plays the role of the glue that, plays, that, that uh, connects pieces of, of geometry together, that assembles geometries together. Um, now, of course, you, you know that I had to mention this, this example in particular to make contact with the conference uh, poster, <laughs> which uh, conveniently included the wormhole. Um, okay, and then the final, the final item I want to talk about, the final example of an important insight that's been, that's been um, understood. Well, actually, let me just briefly say that once one has this setting with a lot of, lot of entanglement, one can, one can do um, useful things with it. In particular, one can talk about quantum teleportation, which is well known in quantum information theory. Uh, as it turns out, if one does that in this setting, uh, one, ends up, uh, one ends up learning that, uh, well, for teleportation, one needs to add an interaction, in fact, now with, between the two pieces. Uh, if one does the corresponding thing on the gravity side, one finds that now, all of a sudden, you can send information through that bridge. So the wormhole becomes uh, traversable, whereas it wasn't before. So teleportation corresponds to just uh, flowing through this bridge, through this wormhole, as it, as it turns out. That's what done by these people. Okay, and then I cannot end before mentioning this very important, uh, very recent development um, that using this same set of tools, this Ryuta Kayanagi formula and generalizations and other insights associated with this, with this story in ADSCFT, um, there are papers from, from just October and November uh, where very important progress has been made um, on the uh, black hole information paradox. As most of you know, uh, this paradox refers to the idea that, uh, well, Hawking discovered that black holes are not black, they, they uh, slowly radiate uh, until eventually they would evaporate, and then he originally postulated that uh, that would mean that the all information about how the black hole was assembled would be lost, no? And since then, the, uh, there's been this challenge of finding out uh, whether or not that's true, whether, whether in fact in the Hawking radiation there is information about the inside of the black hole, about what went into the black hole. Well, uh, there's no time, of course, to review this in, in, in detail, in any detail, but just let me just show you a picture here and tell you that uh, th with these tools, it, it, they found in specific settings available to this ADSCFT correspondence, 
some idealized settings, that, uh, that in fact, that, that, in, that indeed, as expected, um, the radiation does eventually contain the information about the inside of the black hole. Uh, okay, so let me not stop there because we don't have time. And let me just summarize then. Uh, the, one of the main things I told you is, well, this is a conference about new trends in, in quantum field theory. The new trend that I've been trying to, to summarize here for you is looking at quantum field theory through the lens of entanglement. And I've tried to argue very quickly that that turned out to be very, very useful. Um, so it will continue to be useful in the com coming years. Now, I've also reminded you that there's this tool available now for 20 years, uh, the ADSCST correspondence, which establishes a very surprising equivalence between non-gravitational quantum field theories and theories of quantum gravity. Um, it's, it's certainly a useful tool to compute entanglement, and it's shown us lots of, um, well, given us lots of insight in that direction, but also other properties in certain strongly coupled con quantum field theories. I also explained that, at least in certain model universes, when one, one can discuss, uh, one can do computations in, in these gravitational theories with, um, under some regional control. Entanglement is found to play a crucial role in the emergence of space time and gravity. It sort of stitches gravity, to, uh, it stitches geometry together. Um, and let me just finish by mentioning that other quantum information theory concepts are also, well, have also been found to be relevant. Tensor networks, quantum error correction, relative entropy, complexity, chaos, entanglement of purification, negativity, and uh, the list keeps going by the day. Uh, so, so there are many useful concepts that the people in this community have uh, explored for many years, and now we've imported them into the setting of quantum field theory and gravity, and they have a very interesting interplay through uh, holography or this holographic or ADS system correspondence. Okay, so I'll shut up now, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alberto. We have time for one question. Yes. So you have discussed that from entanglement information, you can recover Einstein equations. Uh, then, with and without a cosmological constant, uh, either sign. And what about magnitude? No. Um, thanks for the question for clarification. Um, secretly, in my energy momentum tensor that I wrote there, I don't know if I go back to that, but in my energy momentum tensor, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was including the cosmological constant in the energy momentum tensor. So, in the examples that we have under most control um, in ADSCFT with this with this tool, um, what happens is on the gravity side you have this asymptotic anti decider boundary condition. So the cosmological constant is negative, certainly different from our universe. Um, and, um, and therefore you reproduce Einstein's equation, but with a, a negative cosmological cost. Okay, so that's the particular setting. So thanks for the question. And you showed variations on, on the shape of the surface on the mm -hmm. right-hand side, and also variations on whether you're on your um, lowest level or excited state mm -hmm. in this left-hand side. How about variations, or how dependent is the right-hand side on, on the choosing of A and AC? So you define this system that you have access to, but that's an deci external decision. How, what happens in yeah, the Yeah, right it's also interesting to explore that. It's also what very interesting to explore that. In fact, uh, well, let me just flip quickly to my backup slide. Because that's uh, equivalent of, of making a decision on the size of the system yeah. and the number of degrees of freedom. Tracking the dependence, well, let me actually the previous one. Tracking the dependence on the size uh, and also the shape of, of the entanglement region is actually also very interesting. The simplest, the simplest idea is just to choose a sphere with a particular radius and, and see how it, the result changes with the, with the radius. Uh, it turns out that when one, one looks at that, well, to begin with, you have a divergent, this is a divergent quantity, but buried within that, there's a, there's a, a quantity that is independent of your regularization. And that quantity is precisely the one that's been made, uh, found to be made contact with um, with the renormalization group. Uh, so the, the coefficient makes contact with this so-called uh, A theorem that was only proved uh, recently, well, not many years ago by Komargovsky and Schrimmer. And, uh, and from this technology in ADSCFT, it was found that, uh, well, this statement here uh, only applies for even space-time dimension, and nothing was known for all space-time dimension. With this technology, uh, an extension, a generalization of this was found to, to all space-time dimension, known as the F theorem. Um, but that again it depends very much on, on keeping track of your of uh, how you evolve with the size, with your choice of which is your choice of, of, of the entanglement region. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. Thank you.